What is the one book that all of Canada should read? That's what we're here to find out. Five notable Canadians are here with me. Each of them has chosen the book they think the entire country should read. And this year, we're looking for one book to shift your perspective. Which one will it be? We'll find out this week. It's the great Canadian book debate. I'm your host, Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads. This is Canada Reads, Canada's annual title fight. Hello and welcome. It's the 22nd edition of Canada Reads. The past few years have been quite a journey. We're still adjusting to post-pandemic life. That said, there is no studio audience this year, but the Canada Reads table is back. I'm seated at this Canada Reads poker table, and I'm ready to talk about books. Helping me to do that in this year's panel uh, are uh, my panelists. They're seated around me. They are big readers. They each have a book they believe will shift your perspective. That is five great titles. And over the next four days, they will narrow this list of five down to one, and they will choose the one book all of Canada should read. It's a huge undertaking, but they are up for the challenge. Let's meet them now. On my left is our first panelist. Being a winner on Canada Reads is something they just might have the answer to. That is because they are a Jeopardy super champion. They are actually the most successful Canadian competitor in Jeopardy history. They're also a writer, a tutor, and a podcast host. Welcome to Canada Reads, Matea Roach. Hi, Matea, how are you? I'm not too bad, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. So tell me, you've had success on Jeopardy. How is gonna, how's that gonna translate to being a winner on Canada Reads? We'll see, I have to actually speak in full sentences on this show, right. so that'll be a new challenge. That's right. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you which book you're championing and you don't have to answer that in the form of a question if you don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. I am <laughs> championing Ducks by Kate Beaton. That's great, thank you, Matea. Next to Matea is our second panelist. He's an educator and performer from UConn. He's known for delivering a message of joy and hope through dance. Videos of him dancing Pangra in cold temperatures have warmed the hearts of millions around the world. Welcome to Canada Reads, Gurdip Pandeir. How are you, Gurdip? I'm doing great, Ali, and I was looking forward to it. I'm sure you are. Canadians have seen you promote love and joy, and, uh, and, and through, through dance, you've made people's lives uh, better in, 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 in innumerable ways. Tell me this, how do you plan to share positivity on Canada Reads? I'm just here to listen. Um, all, all the books are there, great books, and uh, I'm just going to create space, space of love, happiness, and positivity. That's going to be my, my plan, just okay. spreading hope. Along with listening, uh, I'm sure there's gonna be some speaking as well. <laughs> Tell me what book are you championing here? I'm championing Hotline by Dimitri Nasrela. Okay. So this is my book. Thank you, Gurdip. Across from me at the Canada Reads table is our third panelist. She's an actor, director, and writer from Vancouver. She's no stranger to being in front of and behind the camera. You've seen her as the Blue Fairy on the show Once Upon a Time, and as the professor of magic on the show The Magicians. And as a director, she's taking her passion for storytelling to new heights. Welcome to Canada Reads, Keegan Connor Tracy. Thank you, thank you for having me. Keegan, how are you feeling? You know, like nervous, excited. I love to talk about books. Uh, it's a bit daunting, but I'm delighted to be here. I'm sure you are. You've been a force in Canadian film and television. Tell me how you're bringing your storytelling skills to the Canada Reads debate. Uh, well, it's pretty easy because I'm championing this wonderful book, Greenwood by Michael Christie, and it's just such a lush tale that uh, I feel like it's easy to champion. Thank you, Keegan. All right, next to Keegan is our fourth panelist. She's a Toronto nursing student and social media star. She's made a huge name for herself talking about books on TikTok. She's known as Groovy Taz, has more than 125,000 followers. That's probably going up as I speak, <laughs> and over 5 million likes online. She's using her Book Talk platform to spotlight books, and now the Canada Read Spotlight is on her. Welcome to Canada Reads, Tasneem Gidi. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. How are you doing? Pretty good, nervous, but excited. Well, you're well known in the TikTok book talk community for uh, for creating videos that go viral. How do you plan to spread this love of books on Canada Reads? Yeah, um, I'm normally used to making like 30 second videos, so making this to 60 seconds is a really interesting challenge, but I'm excited. <laughs> and I like to use my platform to champion own voice stories, and I'm so glad I get to bring that here. The fact that you can work 
tight to a clock well, it might, might be an advantage. Tell us about the book you're championing. What is Mexican Gothic? <laughs> <laughs> By Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Okay, <laughs> doing what you didn't feel like doing there, Matia. I Thank you, you very much, Tasneem. Our final panelist is on my right. We've completed the Canada Reads Circle. He is an actor, a choreographer, a director with a sparkling career on stage and screen. He's known for roles in TV shows like Rutherford Falls, films like Blood Quantum. He is Plains Cree from Muskeg Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. Welcome to Canada Reads. Michael Gray Eyes. Thank you. How are you feeling, Michael? Ah, really good. Really good. All right. Uh, we've seen you in countless TV shows and films. Tell me, which character are you going to channel um, for Canada Ooh. Reads? Ooh. Maybe Terry Thomas from Rutherford Falls. Terry Thomas, very thorough, very yes. precise. Yes. All right. Tell us about the book you're championing, Michael. Um, I'm championing Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mendel. All right. Thank you. There you have it. Our Canada Reads 2023 contenders. We know the players, it's time to learn the game. Matea, Gurdip, Keegan, Tasneem, and Michael, we're gonna go around the room. We will play a trailer for each book, and then you will get 60 seconds to make your opening arguments. And when your time is up, I will ring the famous Canada Reads bell. You're gonna hear that sound quite a bit this week. <laughs> now, I just wanna make it clear, uh, Michael Gurdip, you might be known for dancing, but Canada Reads, is also a radio show and a podcast, so uh, you can't dance your opening arguments. <laughs> rules are okay. rules. Okay. If you take a moment dance to books. Adjust. Yeah, after your opening statements, it'll be time to debate. And uh, before the day is over, you will cast your very first vote. All right, Matea, you're up first. You are championing the graphic memoir Ducks by Kate Beaton. Let's listen to the trailer. Meet Katie Beaton. She's 21 years old. She wants to be a cartoonist. She's fresh out of school and saddled with debt. Reluctant to leave behind her close-knit seaside community for life in the unforgiving oil sands. Where bulldozers are the size of buildings, the attention and harassment are constant. It's hard and lonely work that can change people for the worse. And the destruction of the environment and the local communities is just the cost of doing business. To survive, she forms bonds, finds hope, camaraderie, and solidarity with a trusted few. Just like ducks, we migrate, seeking greener pastures, bluer skies, and the promise of a better life. Matea, you have 60 seconds. Why is Ducks the one book all of Canada should read? Uh, so as I think folks can see from watching the trailer, Ducks is a book that deals with a lot of incredibly heavy subject matter from economic migration, having to move between provinces in search of a better life, uh, gender-based violence and the difficulty of being a woman in an incredibly male-dominated environment, also the environmental degradation and the cost of doing business in the oil sands in that sense. I think the one thing that is so unique about Ducks and why everyone, sort of regardless of, of age and whether they're big readers, should read it is because of the graphic novel form, it's incredibly accessible to the reader. It gives you a window into dealing with these heavy subjects. I also think Ducks is a trans-regional story. It's something that has relevance for people, regardless of where in the country they come from and what their background is. Uh, myself, I really felt seen in this book as somebody who also moved away from Nova Scotia in hopes of accessing opportunities that I couldn't have had back home in Nova Scotia. But I think for people maybe who are from out west, who are from the parts of the country where the oil sands are active, there's a lot to take in. So it is literally a book that everyone in this country, I believe, should read. Thank you, Matea. All right, Gurdip, you're up. You are championing the novel Hotline by Dimitri Nasrella. Let's play the trailer. The year, 1986. My name, Muna Haddad. Leaving behind a civil war in Lebanon, I fled with my son, Omar. I lost my family. I lost my husband. I came to Montréal in winter. The weather is cold. Our prospects are colder. We are alone. Omar isn't fitting in at school. I am living paycheck to paycheck. One day I find a job. I'm a hotline operator for a weight loss center. Over the phone, my clients have everything to lose. 
Yet I have something to offer. I talk, I listen, I hear their secrets. I earn their trust. Montréal is a bit warmer now, as are we. Our story in Canada has just begun. Pradeep, 60 seconds are on the clock. Why is Hotline the one book all of Canada should read? The book Hotline and I is something in common. In the wilderness of the Yukon Territory, I dance Pangada and I send messages of joy, hope and positivity. That's one good way to send joy and positivity. But there's one more great way to send hope and positivity. That's by learning about other people, especially people who look different, who come from different backgrounds, who come from different faiths and who are newcomers. So, so I'm championing this book, Hotline, which opens a window to other cultures, be friends with other people, build cross-cultural bridges, create one inclusive Canada, bring everybody together, and shift your perspective. Thank you, Gurdeep. You get 10 seconds to spare. I'm just going to ring the bell early, <laughs> and maybe we'll add his. nine, see how you can take this. Thank you, Gurdeep. Keegan, you're next. You're championing the novel Greenwood by Michael Christie. Let's check out the trailer. The Greenwood family is like a tree with the rings growing ever outward. Brothers Harris and Everett were loggers bound by tragedy, but they split apart and followed their own paths. Willow was a tree-hugging activist running from her father's shadow and pruning away past sins. Liam was a woodworker who turned reclaimed wood into art, defined and undone by sacrifice and solitude. And tree scientist and nature guide Jake must find her way in a withering world before it's too late. The green woods are rooted, hardy, they stand tall, but what binds them all isn't blood, it isn't their name, it's fate. Keegan, you have 60 seconds. Why is Greenwood the one book that all of Canada should read? Greenwood shows us how to see the forest for the trees, and it can shift perspective in ways that every Canadian can relate to because it is foremost a book about family and all the trials and the tribulations that can bind us together or tear us apart. We all belong to families and each of them are complicated. And um, it, this book challenges us to look back through our own histories and ask why things happened the way they did. And in doing so to find understanding and forgiveness and healing. And so we extrapolate that out to the wider Canadian family. And we see that we have to look to our past and reconcile it, how we treated each other and the land, how we ignored the wisdom of indigenous people and so ended up in this precarious place. Uh, but if we begin to heal it, we can avoid the fate that awaits the Canada in Greenwood of 2038. Uh, the heartwood of this book teaches us that in looking to the past to better understand one another, not only can we heal our immediate families, but we can also heal the Canadian family at large, as well as the land on which we all live. Thank you, Keegan. All right, Tasneem, it's your turn. You are championing the novel Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno-Garcia. Let's roll the trailer. Noemi Taboada is a rich socialite, living a life of luxury in 1950s Mexico City. But one day, her cousin, Catalina, sends a letter. Catalina is in distress. Her English husband, Virgil Doyle, has plans to poison her. Noemi sets off to Catalina's home in the mountains to rescue her cousin. But the dark, dank mansion, the high place, has secrets of its own. What lies within is unspeakable violence and a family curse. Noemi must face her fears and destroy the high place once and for all. Sixty seconds are on the clock, Tasneem. Why is Mexican Gothic the one book that all of Canada should read? because this is a story that caters to such a wide audience. Like for those who have just started reading this year, the writing is incredibly accessible and immersive, making it easy to transport yourself into this world. Or for those experienced readers who want to try something different or unique, 
Sylvia takes the Gothic horror genre and makes it completely her own. And that's what really separates Mexican Gothic from the other books. It's how it challenges the genre it occupies. And it's also the only book on the table not fully set in Canada, which facilitates a unique avenue for social commentary. Now, I'm the first to admit, you know, this story is not the most conventional book to win Canada Reads. But let's be real, the last two years have been anything but. And this is the year to change perspectives. A lot of people view horror as incapable of impactful storytelling and how it relies on jump scares or absurd, or absurd plots for shock value. But that is not the case here. I loved how the author used the gothic aesthetic to not only examine colonialism, but the idea of a return past. From its lush prose, symbolic imagery, and flawed but engaging protagonist, reading this felt like a fever dream in the best way. And for all those reasons, I think Mexican Gothic is not only worth your time, but can completely change your perspective. Thank you, Tasneem. Right on the bell. Michael, you're sitting to me, you're sitting next to me on my right, making you the final panelist. You are championing the novel Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. Here's the trailer. Toronto. A production of King Lear. On stage, the star has a heart attack. A paramedic tries to save his life. An eight-year-old actress sees it all unfold. Meanwhile, the Georgia flu spreads around the world. A pandemic, and with it panic, chaos, and death. 20 years later, the little girl, Kirsten, is fully grown. She's in a troupe of actors and musicians who travel across the Great Lakes. She doesn't remember much from before, but she remembers Arthur, King Lear that night. She still has the comic books he gave her. They hold the key to remember what was lost and to find our way forward. You have 60 seconds, Michael. Why is Station Eleven the one book all of Canada should read? Station Eleven is a story about the ways we hold on to each other when the world around us falters. This novel follows five endlessly fascinating characters across decades and through a life-altering pandemic. Station Eleven redefines an entire genre of fiction, one that I love and that I grew up with. But more than that, it spoke to me on a deeply personal level because of its beauty, its imaginative scope, and its declaration of hope. And in this moment, still haunted by COVID, it's a book this country needs. All right, thank you, Michael. And sticking to time, very nice. There you have it. Those are the titles in the running for Canada Reads 2023. They are Ducks by Kate Beaton, championed by Matea Roach. Hotline by Dimitri Nasrala, backed by Gurdip Bandere. Greenwood by Michael Christie, chosen by Keegan Connor Tracy. Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia, backed by Tasneem Gidi. And Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, championed by Michael Grayeyes. There are five books on the table, each with the potential to shift your perspective. And by the end of the week, one will be your winner. But by the end of today, one will be eliminated. I'm your host, Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads on CBC and Sirius XM. It's time to debate. Each of the five books on Canada Reads 2023 is unique in its own way. We've got a graphic memoir, gothic horror, also literary, contemporary, dystopian fiction. Different formats, different genres, different ways of telling a story. There's something here for every book lover. But we all have different tastes in what we like to read. So with that in mind, why will readers fall in love with the genre and the format of your book? Matea, let me start with you. Yeah, for sure. So I think I somewhat alluded to this in my opening statement, but I think that what Ducks does so well is it makes very difficult subject matter accessible through the graphic novel form. So unlike a memoir that is written entirely in prose that maybe feels heavy, that you feel like you need to put it down and take regular breaks just to kind of get away from the subject matter, I think that putting difficult subject matter into this type of format 
makes it a little bit easier to swallow, particularly for people who maybe are not memoir readers who typically look to books as a form of escapism. I think another thing that I really enjoyed about Dex that I mentioned to Kate when I was talking uh, to her in the run-up to the debates is the way that, like, having images and, in fact, character references throughout the book as Kate moves from worksite to worksite helps me keep track of the various characters that she encounters along her journey. Um, there's a lot of folks that only show up in this book for a period of what would have been maybe a couple of months in real life, but who are really impactful and have their kind of own stories to tell. So that's something that I think Dux does uniquely that some of these other books uh, don't necessarily do and that can make it an engaging and accessible read. Um, yeah, I have a lot to say about why graphic novels are worth reading generally, but I'll try and keep it to this book specifically. I don't need to defend, like, the work of Alison Bechtel today. Sure. Uh, Keegan, let me ask you, what do you think of what Matea said there? You know, I, I hear it, and I listened, and I do agree that it, it, it was accessible in that respect, and in some ways almost too much so. I felt, uh, you know, I, I, I read it the first time in four hours, which is a light read in some ways. It achieves what you're saying, but at the same time, I felt it lacked sort of nuance and character depth that I wanted. And I found, even in my second pass, I was constantly going back and trying to find who these people were. And uh, I was putting down people's names at the top, and honestly, I have Kate and others I can't name. Mike, with a question mark. There was no, very few characters that really stuck with me, and I think mm -hmm. it's part of this as a format of the graphic novel. Granted, it's new to me, and I'm glad that I was introduced to it, but I think a lot of readers are going to find it hard to follow. And in fact, I think Kate said the same in your interview with her, that her publisher said as much. Um, and I do think that's going to be a non-starter for a lot of people. Michael, let me ask you, you've spoken about your love of uh, dystopian fiction in your opening argument, but what are your thoughts on, uh, on this particular genre? That, you, uh, you know, I, I love the graphic novel. Um, I, I grew up as a, as a fanboy, and comics were a place of solace for me and excitement. Um, I loved Ducks. I thought it was uh, really, really beautiful. In terms of like the amount of characters and, and, and the way characters were treated in the novel, um, I feel this was actually sort of like form follows function. You know, that there were so many faces, that there were so many people uh, that Katie encountered. You know, it was kind of like a blur, but, but that was the intent, you know, that was, that was that was the experience, the lived experience of that character. And so for me, you know, like, as I tried to keep track of things, I said, oh, this disorientation, that's what Katie must have felt. And it helped place me inside her story, like, even better. Justine, I want to ask you, maybe not so much about Ducks, but, you know, you've chosen a gothic horror novel. And I wanted to ask that question about why will readers fall in love with the genre and format of something they may not be uh, familiar with, similar to the way they're yeah. not familiar with the... Uh, with this uh, Ducks You know, it. going into Mexican Gothic, I read it about a year ago, and I'm not typically a horror fan. I normally, you know, go with romance or with fantasy books. So going into this, I was really apprehensive about it. But Sylvia Moreno Garcia, like, her true talent lies in the fact that she, you know, wears many hats. You know, she writes fantasy books. She writes historical romance. She writes magical realism. So for fans who are worried that this is a horror book... I say give it a chance because there are so many themes inside of it and so many different genres that she plays with it that it's, it's not just a horror book. There's so much more to it. So, yeah, I say give it a chance. There's so much into it. Gudeep, let me ask you what your thoughts were both about uh, you know, Mexican Gothic and, and that genre in particular and the, the, the genre that Dux has, the graphic novel. Okay, I'll start with the uh, Mexican Gothic first. Um, yes, this was uh, quite... Uh, Wonderful, entertaining book. Um, I enjoyed reading it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fun thing I found that the house itself, a character, like a house is speaking to the people over there and people are seeing the house in their dreams, uh, like the horror, that portrayal. Uh, it was unique. Um, yeah, only one point I noted that, uh, like, uh, beginning was... Uh, bit uh, slow and uh, there was lots and lots of fantasy at the end of the novel in last 50 or 60 pages. Um, but overall, it was a good, fun, entertaining story. And coming about uh, ducks, um, like Michael said, that I also love uh, graphic uh, uh, novels. Um, and it's a, it's a story of Kate Beaton. And, and interestingly, when I started reading about that book and Mavu, 
uh, the place where she is from, uh, it came in front of me and I spent my time in Mabu last year. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and I've been to Mabu and also I've been to Fort McMurray area. So uh, all, all those incidents happened. I had that personal connection of being there. Um, yeah, through her story, um, she presents uh, the, side, the side of oil sands, which most of Canadians, they didn't know, because uh, uh, we know um, Alberta's oil sands more about the place where people go, they make money, they, they, they have careers, and they come back home. But there's another side, which is the uh, hurting side, too. And uh, this uh, novel beautifully is able to let other people know that what's going on behind the scenes, same like movie, like when we, when we watch a movie, uh, we have all the fun, good stuff, but there's a lot happens behind the scenes. So this uh, graphic novel talks behind the scene things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael, dystopian fiction, why will <clears throat> readers fall in love with that genre, that format of your book? You know, when you think about um, novels that are written in different time periods, um, it allows those authors to really comment on the current moment. So when I think about science fiction, you know, which I grew up, you know, that was my first love in reading. Um, you're able to look at these, these, you know, futuristic worlds or alternate realities. And actually it's a way to really think about who we are. Like, what do we do? How are we moving forward? So uh, Station Eleven is incredible for this, um, not only because it imagines um, a world 20 years after a, you know, an earth-shattering pandemic, but it moves, you know, through through the moments right before the, the outbreak begins. It moves, you know, decades further than that. So really, um, it's a chance for, I think, the reader and the audience to sort of recognize. Uh, elements, you know, um, love, relationships, fatherhood, um, essential, uh, essential ideas and, and, and facts of our life um, from a new perspective. I want to get you to weigh on, uh, in on that, Matea. I mean, dystopian fiction is very different from a very personal memoir, but what do you, how do you feel about what Michael's saying about uh, what do dystopian fiction is able to do? I think I, I really agree with a lot of what Michael is saying, actually, about the role of dystopian fiction and how it like often serves as a mirror, I think, of our of our own society. My one thought with Station Eleven, and this isn't really so much a criticism of the book proper as much as it, as it is maybe of like the timeliness of it as a Kenda Reads contender, is I feel as though Station Eleven uh, was published, I believe, in 2014, right before we lived through COVID, and I think that. What I noticed as I was reading it is that a lot of the insights that I think might have been super revelatory had I read this book in, say, 2019, felt like things that I had somewhat intuited just through living through the past three years in terms of the importance of really holding on to the relationships in your life, the importance of art, of theater, of music, and keeping those things a priority even in times of great strife. I think that those are all really valuable insights, but I also felt like they weren't necessarily new to me, and so I didn't maybe feel like my perspective was shifted as as much as it might have been had I read this book a couple years ago. I don't think that's the fault of the book at all, right? Emily St. John Mandel wrote this before COVID, but I do think it's kind of an interesting element of this book being on this show now as opposed to in pre-pandemic times. Well, as you bring up time, Keegan, your book travels <laughs> back and forth through time, mm -hmm. so I wonder what your thoughts are about that and, and what, uh, what, what that offers readers and, and why, why would they fall in love with that format. It's like in the woodcut in the trailer. I thought it was really fascinating how you can zoom out and it, it's so easy to take a, a piece of time as just this slice. But when we, you know, zoom out and see all those rings and how they're connected and, and sort of how uh, it says something like all of time exists at once, it sort of almost approaches quantum physics in that respect. Uh, you can't take what there is now without looking at what came before it. And I think that's part of the magic of a book that travels through time. Um, I, I think that that's one of the, the magical things about this book is being able to see not just how this character and, and to judge them as they are, you know, Harris is just such a mean father. Well, if you look back in time at why that is, then you start to understand him better. And I just think it gives you this scope of vision. Um, and I really love that about stories that travel through time and don't just necessarily take place in one time sure. frame. Justine, what, do you, how, what are your feelings about that? Yeah, I thought it was so unique, the fact that they 
or, well, Michael, how he structured the book, that it was like the rings of a tree. But when I was going through it, especially when you think of the consequence of it, the beginning character and how she's supposed to be the one that ties everything together, for, her, for me at least, it wasn't super developed compared to the middle of the tree, which mm -hmm. is, I guess, his point, right? To go right to Everett. But with Jacinta, I loved her so much. You know, she is a scientist. You know, she believes in decentralizing knowledge. And to go from her in the beginning to see her character motivations completely shift towards the end without the things that are happening in the middle not really influencing her decision whatsoever. Because in the beginning of the book, she knows that she is way overqualified to work at the Greenwood uh, Conservatory. I'm forgetting the name of it right now, but she knows that she's overqualified, but the main driver for her is money. And then you go to her at the end, you know, Nut asks her, please, like, let's, you know, destroy the trees. We need to save what we can. And she's like, no, I can't again because of money. So I felt like she was trying to do something from what happened in the middle, but nothing in the middle really influenced her at the end to make that drastic decision. It was just the ending. She doesn't know about what happened in the middle. She doesn't know that Everett is really the man that was her father. She doesn't, un she doesn't, that's sort of kind of the point is what we don't know about the history of things, mm -hmm. even within our own families, what can, can tear us apart. If she only knew so many of those things, I think she could have been a different person altogether, as could any of the people along those generations. And, and all of us, and all of us as Canadians, if we're looking at you know, the wider picture of mm -hmm. why we are so disenfranchised or why we're divided across political lines or you know, racial lines, if we look back in history, that helps us understand. And she really just didn't have the benefit of that until she read that, uh, the, the novel. I, I had a problem with the ending too about mm -hmm. why it didn't kind of match up. And, I had to really step back and think about the fact that she really realized that she didn't have a case. Do you know what I mean? And, and it was once she looked at her history that she realized it, that she found it in that novel, or not in the novel, but in the diary. Let's wrap up this section. Gurdip, I want to ask you, as far as you know, unique genres go, uh, this genre in, in Hotline is really one woman's sort of perception portrayal of her, of her life. Why will people fall in love with that? Yeah, as uh, Ali, you said that this is story of Mona is one character and she tells her, her story and we learn a lot through her. Um, I feel that she's able to shift the perspective because uh, she brings uh, a new perspective, a, a, a new uh, voice uh, uh, to her in, her in the story of her development. Uh, we see her that, that coming from such a struggling time in, in Lebanon and settling down in Montreal, where she faces so many barriers, so many struggles. Uh, her French is recognized as a wrong French. Uh, she can't get a job as a teacher. Then her son, he faces uh, challenges in, in the school. Then, uh, then she, uh, she struggles a lot. And despite that, she is able to find hope uh, and she's able to connect with uh, with all the customers at uh, uh, at Nutrifort. Uh, um it also it also gives us a uh, uh, hope. Uh, it also gives us a, a joy and how that one person who is struggling, who is going through a lot, uh, who is uh, at verge of collapse, like uh, crying, uh, going through those kind of moments, but still rising through her resilience. Um, so so through her book, we we learn learn about uh, uh, people from different culture. We learn learn about hope. We learn about uh, how uh, building uh, different connections, different relations, they are important. Uh, uh, so yeah, okay. this, this we'll book does a great job in that way. We'll leave it there. That's it for this round. Thank you. OK, panelists, Canada Read is a great debate about books. It can get intense. It can get strategic. It can also get emotional. So I'm sure you could all do with some encouragement for the days ahead. We ask those who know the books best to give you a little Pep talks. Let's listen to this. Tasneem, you're the youngest champion here, which might be perceived as a disadvantage, but that also means you're very nimble. I mean that literally, you can probably win in hand-to-hand -hand combat, which <laughs> might be necessary. You've got heart and a capacity for amazement, two crucial building blocks, not only in a competition, but in life. Have fun. Michael, hi, it's Emily. I want you to know how much I appreciate you championing my work. Getting to have my book in Canada Reads has been a pretty incredible thing. My favorite thing about it has been talking to you. I, I really enjoyed those conversations that we've had. I truly appreciate it, and I'm cheering you on. Hello, Gurdip. This is Dimitri. I wanted to wish you well at the beginning of this Canada Reads week, a pivotal week for both of us. I trust that our shared message 
of hope, of perseverance, of resilience will shine through. Wishing you a good debate. Can't wait to hear how it turns out. Hello, Medea. I've lost my voice. Maybe it's also a little bit appropriate because you're going to be my voice now. Huh. And uh, I couldn't choose a better one. I know you're going to do an amazing job. I keep joking to people that if my book does well, it won't be because of me, it will be because of you. But secretly, that's not a joke at all. <laughs> that's totally what I think. <laughs> hey, Keegan, it's Mike. I just wanted you to know that I've placed a large bet on the outcome of this year's Canada Reads. And look, it's a lot of money. Uh, it involved a second mortgage, but you don't need to worry about that. You just focus on, I'm just kidding. Uh, in seriousness, I just wanna say thanks. You're talking about literature on television and people are tuning in and that's already a victory for writers. It's a victory for readers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Those were the voices of this year's Canada Reads Authors Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, Emily St. John Mendel, Dimitri Nasrallah, Kate Beaton, and Michael Christie. Kate Beaton playing the role of the godfather. <laughs> <laughs> oh, afraid of. Uh, I'm Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads on CBC and Sirius XM. Let's get back to the debate. These five books are set in different time periods and locations, and each of them reflects the distinctly Canadian way that these authors see the world and themselves in it. Canada Reads is about finding the one book all of Canada should read. So the question to you, panelists, is which book of all of these is most relevant to Canadian readers today and why? Tasneem, let's start with you. Um, well, I'm here to champion Mexican Gothic, so I think I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna stick with her. Uh, this book isn't set in Canada. It's, I know, like most of the books that are here, but what I love the most about it is the fact that Sylvia was able to use, you know, the horror genre to be a vehicle to explain how colonialism and white supremacy still persists today. You know, if we look at the history of Gothic literature, literature it's, you know, primarily in Europe. And the fact that she was able to use that, twist that, to be able to speak on behalf of Mexicans in Mexico City right now it was amazing, and that's why I loved it. Um, in relation to Canadians, I know a lot of people think, like, oh, it's a horror book, oh, it's, you know, a gothic horror, it's not set here, what does that have to do with me? Like, this book could not exist without colonialism. It could not exist without white supremacy, and that is not a stranger to what's happening here. Like, mass graves of Indigenous children are still being uncovered today, reflecting on the history of this country. So I think the story is a great way to have a conversation about it because it allows, like, a little bit, a little degree of separation, you know, from Mexico City to here that allows people to have those conversations that they're not willing to talk about yet. So, yeah, I think it's a really interesting way to shift perspectives. Michael, what are your thoughts on that uh, comment that the scene, that the scene oh, was made? I thought that was beautifully articulated. Um, you know, because when I, I, I adore the book, I adore Mexican Gothic. Um, uh, I think one of the issues that I had when I read it um, was, as Gurdip said, it's pacing. But you know, that's not the book's fault. The book was like beautifully designed. Um, it's actually a criticism I have with Lovecraft. <laughs> you know, Lovecraft, you know, the, the way, like, there's this terror, this terror that's coming, it's, it's unspeakable terror. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it builds and builds and builds, and finally it reveals the terror, and you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> okay. But that's Lovecraft. Um, I, I do agree that um, being able to transpose um, the story about colonialism in, in, you know, Central America to Canada is accurate. Um, but at the same time, I found it difficult for me um, to, you know, make those settings resonate for me with a northern perspective. It, it, it was a struggle. Keegan, let me ask you, um, you can respond to that. And also the question is, which book is most re relevant to Canadian readers? I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it from <laughs> I don't think you. any of us are going to pick somebody else's book in that respect. Uh, I, I certainly, I, I agree and echo Michael's statements for... While I recognize that it opens up the conversation in the same way that Ducks does, it, it, it's like you, you couch it differently and it opens up the conversation for us to have. Um, I, I think that Greenwood is successful, successful in that respect as well. I think we're talking about the effects also of colonialism, of these you know, sort of white scions of industry who came to Canada and just leveled it, irrespective of who was there already and what knowledge they had. And this sort of like rich white man getting richer and at the expense of everybody else, I think is, is an undertone of this book, 
even though it's really a book about families. And again, I, I, stay, I say that we all have families, we all understand that part of it. But I think what it does is then open up the conversation about how we are where we're at, both in the relations to uh, indigenous peoples in this country and how they were treated as these lumber barons were moving across the country or oil barons or mining. Um, it, it just, it opens the conversation in, in that way. I've asked, there's two questions that I'm really asking here. One is that, you know, which, which book is uh, most uh, relevant to readers, um, but also, you know, it can or cannot be yours. And let, me, Gudeep, let me ask you, what is the relevance of uh, your book to readers? And what, 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 what should, uh, is it the book Canadians need to read today? Yeah, in terms of uh, being which one book is relevant, uh, so in, in Hotline, um, we not only learn about uh, a story of a woman going through struggles, barriers, and other things, we also learn where many nuances of Canadian society itself too. People going through struggle, isolation, mental health, and they are finding channels to express it. So I could connect in my own ways, uh, um, Mona, the protagonist in this book, uh, she's receiving phone calls and people are revealing their personal struggles. I receive letters, all the way, uh, handwritten letters in the Yukon, uh, unknown people sharing their stories and talking about their mental health and struggles and uh, different ways that they are trying to find to cope with, with it. So I think this book is relevant because that's what we are seeing in Canada these days. Uh, um, is, uh, we are still uh, dealing with pandemic, uh, dealing with stresses of it, uh, not only just pandemic, uh, inflation and other things, uh, uh, and, and people, people are struggling in relationships, uh, in family setups. Up, set up. So, so that book uh, reveals a lot, connects a lot about uh, about uh, Canadian culture, Canadian uh, society, Canadian family setup. Uh, um, so, in that way, this book is very relevant. Matei, let me ask you. Godeep broadened uh, his, his 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 statement, but he started by saying it connected to me in particular. Is this a book that you connected with? Is it relevant to Canadian readers? I think it is relevant to Canadian readers for sure. I don't have the same personal connection with this book, maybe as Godeep has, or some other readers might have. Um, my family history is like definitely a lot more kind of connected to the stuff that we see in Ducks and the stuff, the stuff that has to do with families that have been in Canada perhaps a little bit longer, even Greenwood, like to a bit of a lesser extent. I do think though that this element uh, that you're mentioning of like people being able to open up over the phone of that, that being something that's really relevant to readers is interesting because I think I viewed Hotline as more of like an economic migration and a looking for a better life, like that kind of story. I think probably because I had the lens of like thinking about ducks and thinking about that element um, of my book. So to pivot, you know, away from kind of, I guess, talking about those thoughts to chatting about uh, why I think this book is super relevant, if that's okay, and I'll prop it up because I haven't shown the cover. Mm. Um, I think what really hit me reading Ducks is it's a story that's like set, you know, I would say about 15 years ago, um, describing the period of time in which Kate Beaton, the author, was working in the oil sands. But the fact of the matter is like a lot of the issues that are raised in this book, whether it is the issue of people having to leave relatively more economically deprived parts of Canada in search of economic opportunities elsewhere, whether it is the just absolute environmental devastation that is being caused by the oil sands uh, and the effects that that's been having on Indigenous communities, like, that is all still very relevant. There's an interview that is excerpted in this book um, with Selena Harp, who is an Indigenous woman from northern Alberta, where she's talking about essentially strange cancers that are being found uh, in communities that live along the Athabasca River that are almost certainly caused by runoff from tailings ponds, but nobody wants to look into it because it means that just the entire operation would come kind of fall apart and become untenable. This is still something that's a problem right now. Like literally this week, Kate, uh, I saw it retweeted an article from APTN where people at a community meeting in Fort Chippewa and were saying the same thing. Every sort of political or social issue that is touched on in this book is something that has not actively been addressed. And I think that for me, the fact that it's so close to our own time and place makes it really actively relevant and engaging for the reader. Justine, let me ask you about that. We have a few minutes left and you're a voracious reader. What were your thoughts on I completely uh, agree with everything you said. I just wrote a paper right now on the TransLink pipeline that's being expanded to BC right now. So reading that while going through this book was very eye-opening for me. But for one thing, you were alluding to like having those conversations about things that are currently happening right now. I can appreciate Ducks for the story that it was. It was Kate's experience, her lived experience mm -hmm. of being in the oil sands. But to have conversations about these bigger issues, there needed to be 
a tiny bit more self-reflection. And she also acknowledged that in her acknowledgement section is that it was kind of only in, it was 95% toxic masculinity and rape culture, which is very important topics to have, but it was only 5% of those larger issues. And hopefully this book does have a gateway to have those greater issues. But in this book, I think I can appreciate for just Kate's lived experience and how awful it was for her. And I honestly felt for her throughout this, this entire book, but to have those greater conversations and the reason why I love reading memoirs and autobiographies in general is that aspect of self-reflection, which I didn't get, but again, I can appreciate the story for exactly what it was. Michael, in the minute that we have left, what is your response to that? Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, both those comments are really valid. Uh, for, for myself, um, Station Eleven, you know, when this pandemic first happened, um, I said in an interview, um, I hope that the systems that pit us against each other um, are, you know, examined or tossed out, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, Station 11 does that for me. You know, I, I look at the systems of work and ambition and fame, however, however you'd like to, to frame it, um, all the characters in Station Eleven have to re-examine if they make it through that, that, that terrible moment. Um, what does their life mean? And, and through the examination of memory, I think uh, Emily really examines you know, how the past works on us in the present. And you know, that's extraordinary. All right, we'll have to leave it there. That is it for this round. Okay, panelists. We're almost at the end of day one. That means it's almost time for our very first elimination. Not just yet. I'm going to give you all a chance to respond to some of the stuff that's been said today, a final word before we head into the votes. So we'll go around the table in the same order that we did at the beginning of the show. That means, Matea, you are up first. Your final word, you have 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I think to respond to some concerns that folks have raised about Ducks today, about the limitations of a memoir specifically, as opposed to a book that is able to engage perhaps with the perspectives of more characters. I think to me that is a feature of this book and not a bug, right? I think that what it lets you do as a reader is contemplate, if I were placed in a situation like what the author has experienced, how might I feel about that? Which, you know, of the side characters perhaps might I become, right? Would I be somebody who is on the receiving end of kind of this like hostile environment as a woman or would I be somebody who's shaped by it in a really negative way? I we'll think that's something we, there. yeah. Thank you, Matea. Okay, Gurdeep, time for your last word. You have 30 seconds on the clock. Whether you are born in Canada or you are new to Canada or you are five, six, seven generations ago, they came to Canada. Accept indigenous peoples, you are still an immigrant. And because of that, um, immigration experience is a fundamental Canadian experience uh, and is a great part of our narrative uh, for those who came uh, last century or this century. We'll so we need to learn there. about this. <laughs> Thank you, Gurdeep. Keegan, 30 seconds for your final words. Uh, well, I just will say that I think what we're looking for, what people are looking for in a book in Canada Reads is something that you can really get lost in, something that you can see something of yourself in. And I think because this book spans this country, it deals with issues that we're all dealing with, whether that be family or environmental or societal, cultural, uh, it deals with all of them. And, and it's also got this great chase and a caper and a mystery. And I just think it's the kind of book that you can really get lost in. And, and that makes it easy to recommend as the book that everyone in Canada should read. Thank you. Tasneem, your turn. You have 30 seconds. If I had to describe Mexican Gothic in one word, it would be otherworldly. Looking at the trailer, looking at this poster, but you can clearly see that it's meant to be in a movie. And yes, it is slower paced. Yes, it's horror. It's a genre that's very maligned in literature. But I think it has such a great way to, you know, start conversations about topics that we're not really ready to discuss. Um, I believe this book is not just a smart and inventive way to view horror, but it's such a captivating read. I cannot think of a more important book for this theme to find a book to change perspectives and a genre defying one. And yeah, yeah. And yeah, thank you, Tasneem. <laughs> Michael, one last chance to persuade the panel. 30 seconds are on the clock. Um, Station Eleven is an extraordinary read. Um, one of the most beautiful things about the book is the way it treats memory. Um, those moments, those people, images that we carry with us. Uh, but not all memories are beautiful or tender. Uh, sometimes they haunt us, or follow us like shadows. Um, the way Emily writes about memory in this book is masterful. 
Okay, thank you. All right, panelists. That's it for today's debate. Why did all those 30 seconds feel like they were different amounts of time? <laughs> yeah. People ended early. I think Some people, people also speak at different speeds, too, and they it makes do. it feel different. I would use this time to vote, to be quite honest. I think you might, you might enjoy <laughs> that. It, today, so it I is time to vote. <laughs> you have your ballots in front of you, panelists. Please mark an X beside the book that you want to eliminate from the competition. Once you voted, Bridget from the Canada Reads team will take your ballot. Do keep in mind there are no secret ballots on Canada Reads. We will all be made aware of your choices. I should also mention that um, something I didn't mention earlier, there's a thematic um, uh, personality that, that has come to the table that, I, you know, for our radio audience, I should mention that Matea uh, is wearing a, a, a shirt that really, I'm, I'm immersed into libraries. There are books, there are libraries, there are uh, clocks on it, really setting that vibe. Keegan, you brought um, some, some of the forest with you, rocks and the Douglas fir. Here, you're dressed in forest green. I got the leaf, Stephen. There's a leaf mm. behind yeah. your head. <laughs> and I should mention to Steam that your earrings, mushrooms, right? Had to do to, it. Uh, well, yeah, represent yeah. the... Uh, the fungus that uh, that grows in Mexican Gothic. So as you think about your vote, and you all made your votes uh, fairly quickly, we'll ask which title will be for the, the, the first to go. Will it be Ducks by Kate Beaton? Matea Roach is championing that graphic memoir. Will it be Hotline by Dimitri Nasrella? That novel was selected by Gurdip Pander. Will it be Greenwood by Michael Christie? Keegan Connor Tracy is supporting that title. Will it be Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia? That novel is being championed by Tasneem Gidi. Or will it be Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, the book chosen by Michael Gray Eyes? All right, I have the ballots. Michael, let's start with you. Which book did you vote against? Um, although I adore the novel, I voted against Mexican Gothic. We have one vote against Mexican Gothic. Gurdip Pandey, how did you vote? I have similar sentiments. Uh, I loved the story, but I voted for Mexican Gothic. Okay, we have two votes against Mexican Gothic. Tasneem Gidi, how did you vote? I also love the novel, but I voted against Greenwood. You have a vote against Greenwood and two against Mexican Gothic. Keegan Connor Tracy, how did you vote? Um, again, I really enjoyed it, um, and I think it's going to make a fantastic series. I hope Mike Flanagan does it, but I voted against Mexican Gothic. Okay, with three votes against Mexican Gothic, that does mean that Mexican Gothic has been eliminated. We mentioned that there are no secret votes on Canada Reads, but Taya Roach... It'd be hilarious if I voted for something else. I also loved Mexican Gothic. I was really glad to read it, but I did vote to eliminate it from the competition. Okay. Well, there you have it. I feel like you did your absolute best, Tasneem. And we have a minute left. Tell me how you're feeling in this moment. Okay. W weirdly, I'm okay. I think maybe because I get to do this regardless being on Canada Reads or not. Obviously, I wanted to bring her all the way, but I think the fact that I'm able to always talk about the books that I love outside of Canada Reads, that... It's not a sting, but, you know, I definitely, yeah. I feel bad for Sylvia. No, I wanted to champion her all the way. I think her book is really worth it, but it's okay. I think it'll be okay. It's a good time to remind people that this book is a bestseller because of mm -hmm. Canada Reads. And, and it's and fourth still... reprint. I, she'll be okay. The she'll be okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Don't That's worry. That's great. Okay. And you are also a free agent now. Mm -hmm. A little bit of your pressure is off. It's up to your panel, fellow panelists, to woo you as well. Mm -hmm. But that is a goodbye to Mexican, go uh, Mexican Gothic. There are four books left. Ducks by Kate Beaton, Greenwood by Michael Christie, Hotline by Dimitri Nasrella, Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. We've got three days, three eliminations to go until we find the one book all of Canada should read. Today's debate is over, but the conversation continues. We're going to talk about what went down today. Uh, you may recognize this, Matea. It's a little bit of the uh, overheard on Jeopardy vibes, right? <laughs> yeah. the behind the scenes yeah. type of thing. Um, I want to talk about 
uh, Mexican Gothic in some way. You all had some, you know, nice things to say. In any case, I we'll, we'll get to you in a moment, Justine. And I think you did say that, you know, you you did your best putting this on the map. But um, tell me, what did you like about this genre, Michael? Was this a new genre to you, Mexican Gothic? Oh no, I love horror. I mean, uh, 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 Gothic horror, I should gothic say. Horror. Was this a new genre to you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I loved about uh, Sylvia's writing um, was that there was like a lushness to her prose mm -hmm. um, that was actually, that elevated above, you know, all the other books in the competition. Her descriptive power, like the way Gurdip had talked about, um, you know, the description of high place, like I felt high place, like viscerally, three-dimensionally. Um, for me, it was, it was tricky because uh, Noemi was like this classic, you know, Bronte sisters type heroine. Um, but her, her status, you know, her wealth, kind of like separated her from me a bit. Um, you know, I come from more modest places and, and I was always struggling to find my way into her worldview, mm -hmm. you know. Um, she was plucky, of course. Uh, so coupled with the pacing, it, it just took me a little bit longer to find my way into that novel. But once it was there, it was like, it was such a great read. You said that you, you love gothic horror. Was this a book that was able to shift your perspective? Um, not about Canada, not about being Canadian. You know, uh, she was so effective at dropping me into uh, the milieu and, and, and the culture of Mexico that I found it hard to translate it back into my own experience. I just went there. It was an extraordinary journey, an escape for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's why I uh, that's why I voted. And we should remember, we should remind people that uh, it's you know the theme is about shifting perspective, not necessarily Canadian perspective, although that is you know what you bring to the table. Keegan, what were your thoughts? What did you like about Mexican Dark? I mean, I really I knew it was a good book because my book club people had recommended it to me like a year ago, mm -hmm. so I knew I was going to like it. And I like horror. Uh, I like I really like all the genres. I I did struggle to really like uh, Noemi. Uh, who I liked the most was Francis, actually. He mm -hmm. sort of felt sort of mm. downtrodden. You couldn't help but root for him. Um, the house was really interesting. And I honestly did, on Twitter, like, said to Mike Flanagan, gosh, I hope you make Mexican Gothic because I think it will really shine uh, on film. I mean, perhaps that's the director in me, but um, I, I just think it has all these, like, really, like you said, lush elements. Uh, but I echo also what Michael said, that I just found it hard to, to translate that into the Canadian experience. Although, by the same token, it it does open up the conversation in a way that sort of eases it for Canadians, you know, because mm. it's not so close to home mm -hmm. that you can talk about colonialism and its effects and racism and eugenics. My God, that part of it was really <laughs> something um, in a way that's removed enough that perhaps can open the conversation better. But I, I did find it a rather, like, I kept calling it a cabin book. You know, it's like a great book to bring to the cabin. Okay, what were your thoughts on the book and, and did it shift your perspective and if so, how? So I will say I'm not usually a genre fiction reader and so Mexican Gothic is the book that I was maybe the most expecting to not love, if, <laughs> if I can put it that way. And I was really pleasantly surprised by it. I liked it a lot more than I thought I was going to. I thought that the incorporation of fungus into the horror was really creative. Like I think mushrooms are so fascinating in the way that those, like they operate in networks and all of these things. Like I thought that that was something that was really creative and unexpected. But like my overwhelming emotion after reading it wasn't, wow, this is a book that shifted my perspective on things that I'm gonna really carry with me. It was, I should read more about Mexican history, which I guess is like not a bad takeaway, but compared to some of the other books in the competition, I didn't really feel like it changed me in some sort of internal way or that I could relate it maybe quite as much to my own experiences. But I am really, really glad you championed it because I probably, no, not probably, certainly would not have read it otherwise and I'm glad that I got the opportunity. Okay. Gurdip, final word to you. What were your thoughts on the book? What did you like about it? I really like the multi-dimensionality of uh, the protagonist, uh, Noemi. Um, the way she is uh, first is uh, shows lead, uh, she goes to parties, and then she's assigned that job, um, um, like checking on her, uh, her cousin, and she switches gears, and now she is, uh, her role is more like uh, protecting herself, protecting her cousin, mm -hmm. and bring everybody out of that. So, so I'll have to leave it there, Gurdip. <laughs> we are out of time, I think that's great, uh, you know, 
compelling sales pitches for your book. That is a wrap on Canada Reads today. Thank you to our panelists, Matea Roach, Gudeep Pandair, Keegan Connor Tracy, Tasneem Gidi, and Michael Grayeyes. They will all be back tomorrow, as will I. We'll see you then. I'm Ali Hassan. Until then, read on, Canada.